Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Son of the North podcast. I am your host, Rex, serving as your guiding light through the darkness of this age. Fall is finally upon us, and I hope you and your loved ones have been having a wonderful start to this most enchanting season. Personally, it is my favorite. It is currently Canadian Thanksgiving weekend as I am recording this. And while I'm recording this, I have a nice elk roast in the oven, so I'm really looking forward to that. I have a lot to be thankful for this year. I have been allowed to start this podcast and reach out to my audience. Reach out to people just like you who care about our ancestral traditions, care about living a life in tune with nature, and care about resisting the evil influences of the modern world. I am so thankful that all of you have joined me on this journey and continue to support me as my program grows. I have been quite preoccupied as of late trying to navigate the bureaucratic mess involved with getting my partner out of the country. What has the world come to? I mean, I've heard of governments doing everything they can to keep people out of their countries, but For the first time in a long time, I feel like our governments are trying their hardest to keep us inside of their countries. Even my girlfriend, who's not a citizen of Canada, is having a hard time leaving. I'm telling you, this is some real Soviet Union type shit. But, you know, I had to take care of business, I've sorted it all out, and she's back home in Italy now. For now, perhaps this is for the best. I strongly believe that love and sensuality is an important part of our spiritual experience. But if we are constantly indulging in our love for our partner in life, in time you start to lose your appreciation for this love. When one is constantly surrounded by love, over time it becomes a given, and this given is often taken for granted. They say that love grows fonder in absence. We can study the example of our ancestors. There would be many times in life where our male ancestors would be forced to leave their homes, their wives, and their families behind in order to do what's best for the tribe. This could perhaps include hunting trips or going off to war. While away from their loved ones, our ancestors would reflect back on the love they had and they would come to a greater understanding of their love and a greater appreciation of the love they have. Back at home, our female ancestors would also reflect on the love they have for their partner and would come to greater understand and appreciate the sacrifices their partners made, spending time away from the family in order to do what's best for the family, for the tribe, and for the nation. Temporarily abstaining from the things we love in life is often quite good for the human mind and body. This short little side will bring us into the topic of today's conversation. Today, we will be talking about the body and how abstaining from certain practices or cutting certain things out of your diet and life can help improve your physical, mental, and spiritual health for the better. I shall start by giving you insight into some health changes I've been making recently. Today, I am currently undergoing a temporary fast, a 16-hour fast, in fact. Now, many people hold varying opinions on the benefits and disadvantageous elements of fasting, but I think it's a good thing for the body every now and then to not be exposed to food. It really stokes that primal element of our existence, that sense that our most ancient ancestors had when food wasn't secure. It really inspires motivation and helps further stimulate your drive and ambition. Let's look at fasting from a very logical perspective. Survival in nature is a constant battle, and no doubt there would be times when our hunter-gatherer ancestors would be unable to put food on the table. Now, in their starvation, surely there would have been some deep evolutionary drive that would stimulate them and further enhance their senses and capabilities so that they would be able to put food on the table. Now, in the Kali Yuga, 
in this time of excess and hedonism, there really isn't many opportunities for most people, living in the first world at least, to not have constant sources of food. With our overabundance of food, there's no doubt that most people on this planet have never experienced this primal urge to work hard to succeed and put food on the table that would have been so commonplace for our ancestors throughout many points in history. No wonder then that so many people in this world who just, you know, constantly stuff their mouths with garbage lack ambition and drive. There are a number of other reasons, of course, why many people in the modern world who live slovenly existences lack ambition and drive. And a lot of this is inspired by the chemicals and other substances we take into our body through our diets and what we drink. But we'll talk about that later in this episode. So yeah, I'm currently 12 hours into this 16 hour fast and really starting to feel it, but I think it's a good thing. In fact, I feel like I might hit the gym later. I want to see if fasting in some ways enhances or impacts my ability to lift weights. I mean, I don't think I'm going to go too hard. I don't want to pass out or anything, but it's going to be an interesting experiment. This is something that many other people who practice fasting can attest to as well. From my experiences, I've really felt spiritually heightened today. In the morning, I was a bit hungry, but didn't eat anything. I woke up and I performed a offering to Sol to commemorate his annual winter return to the underworld. I always feel spiritually attuned to my surroundings when I'm performing a ritual, but for some reason, during this fast, when I was performing this oblation to Sol, there was a really deep feeling of warmth and connection to the deity during this time. I can't exactly describe it. But I suppose this explains why fasting is such a big part of many religious traditions around the world. If we think about it, Christian mystics would fast. Obviously, fasting is a big part of Islam. And there are many times and occasions where Buddhists and Hindus will also fast. I would imagine that by fasting, we are putting our body into this semi-starved state. And because of this, we are less grounded to the material reality of the realm around us. As a result of this, perhaps our spiritual senses are more heightened and our ability to contact and interact with the divine is more sharpened. Now before you go off and start on a fast yourself, make sure to do your research first. I've seen some accounts that have promoted fasting quite regularly and I don't think this is a fairly healthy option. I've heard some people saying that they do it about once a month, others saying they do it about once every two weeks. This is really my first experience with fasting, so I can't give any advice on that, but I would definitely recommend that before starting on fasting yourself, you do a bit more research on it and think about what works for you. Now, just because I'm fasting, it doesn't mean that I want to starve my body of nutrients. So I made a special concoction of, uh, I guess you could call it nutrient water. I filled up a big pitcher with filtered water, and we'll talk more about filtered water later. But I filled up the pitcher with filtered water, and I also cut up some slices of cucumber, and some carrots, and a few slices of lemon, and I tossed those in there. I also added some important mineral salts for our body, and I let this concoction sit for a bit before I started my fast. So this is kind of the, uh, the electrolyte fuel that I'm gonna be using while I'm fasting and I'll also bring it with me when I go to the gym in about an hour. And honestly, it tastes delicious, you know, infused with the vegetables, but I feel like it's healthier than regular water, to be honest. I mean, there's many different sources of water that people can drink. It is undeniable that drinking plenty of water is important to maintaining a healthy body but I know many would agree with me in saying that in the modern world we live in, where everything is so altered with chemicals, that drinking water just isn't enough. If I was to be more specific, drinking bad water 
just isn't enough. In fact, it may do the body more harm than good. The average person probably doesn't think too much about where the water they drink comes from. Many people will drink water from water bottles, and others will drink tap water. Now, both of these sources of water are infiltrated by chemical substances that are harmful to your health. But of the two, drinking pure tap water is definitely the worst option. Tap water really isn't fresh water coming out of a source from the ground. In fact, it's quite far from it. A more appropriate name for tap water would be recycled water, because the water that comes out of the taps in your home is sourced from a highly complex system of water filtration and cleansing that involves harsh chemical products. Certainly, this helps prevent most of the population from drinking bacteria-laden water. But, not enough people question the exact process of water filtration as it is run by major urban jurisdictions. We often think about the cleansing of water from bacteria, and indeed many bacteria found in water, for example, Giardia, can pose a major health threat to the body. But, many people don't think about the health hazardous substances that the urban water filtration systems do not remove. Many also don't think about the things that are added to tap water as well. It is a well-known fact that in many jurisdictions, fluoride is added to water in trace amounts. The argument behind adding fluoride to water is that it serves to strengthen teeth and bones. And of course, the scientists who advocate such things say that the trace amounts of fluoride in water are not enough to harm the human body. However, anybody with an elementary understanding of compound theory knows that this cannot be true. Surely that trace amount of fluoride on its own is not harmful enough to the body, but when you are consuming eight glasses of tap water a day potentially, you are arguably compounding that amount of fluoride within the body, and surely that compounded amount of fluoride is not good for you. The common symptom of fluoride overexposure that is cited in many metaphysical health circles is the calcification of the pineal gland. Many people would argue that the proper functioning of the pineal gland, which is located above and between your two eyes, is essential to humans' ability to have spiritual experiences. I am not well versed in the topic of the pineal gland and the third eye myself, but it would make a lot of sense that the servants of the powers that be, the servants of the adversaries, would take measured steps to calcify the pineal glands of the populace in order to prevent them or limit their ability to interact with the divine nature of reality, to interact with the gods of our ancestors. Surely, such a thing would be beneficial for the adversaries in their goal to subdue the population. Of course, the easiest way to calcify the pineal glands of the average plebeian would be to put fluoride in their tap water and recommend that they drink lots of water every day. Other chemical additives are added to tap water as well, and unlike fluoride, these are much less researched. We haven't even started to talk about the things that the filtration processes of the urban water system fail to remove from tap water. There is no doubt that drinking tap water can influence the hormonal balance of your body. To substantiate my point, I will cite one extremely powerful example. We know that a significant percentage of the female population of Western countries consumes one form of birth control or another in order to regulate their reproductive processes. For now, I'm not going to discuss 
the dangers of birth control treatments and their impact on the bodies of women because, frankly, it's a topic I'm not very well versed in and it's a very important topic. I feel like it could almost deserve an episode of its own. Ideally, I can find a guest who knows a lot about this subject. But we do know for a fact that these birth control treatments contain a large number of hormones, particularly female hormones that regulate and affect reproductive processes. It is, of course, also well known that these hormones, when found in excess in male bodies, can have severe negative impacts on the functioning of the male reproductive system, as well as the functioning of the male body in general. I'm not going to get too gross, but we do know that what goes into the body at some point must come out. Hormones are a very chemically strong structure, and so they are able to pass through the body. Thus, the hormones found in birth control pills are not only affecting the people that take these pills, but these hormones also enter into the public water supply and potentially impact the people that drink from this public water supply. Some recent studies have suggested that the public water filtration systems are not really able to get the hormones from birth control out of water. Therefore, if you were to go to the tap right now and pour yourself a glass of water and drink it, you would likely be ingesting trace amounts of these hormones that are found in birth control pills. Consumption of these xenoestrogens, as they are found in the public water supply system and found in a number of other foods and substances we encounter on a daily basis, could potentially be cited to explain the dropping levels of testosterone found in young men over the generations. Some of you may have seen this, and I think it might be a bit sensationalist, but it's interesting nonetheless. I remember seeing on Instagram posts talking about a study that showed that the average testosterone levels in young men today, I believe they were the sample size, or the sample for the study was men at the age of 18, that these 18-year-old men actually had lower testosterone levels than 67-year-old men from 20 years ago. Which, if you think about it, is absolutely absurd. When you are 18 years old, you know, this is during puberty, during the peak of your sexual development, your testosterone levels should be extremely high. <laughs> and they should certainly dwarf the testosterone levels of a 67-year-old man. And we could talk about larger generational trends, but this isn't like we're talking about testosterone levels from the 1940s and the modern day. This is 20 years ago. This is the 2000s. So <laughs> this is really alarming, and it would not... In fact, there is no doubt in my mind that the drop in testosterone levels that we see in youth today can be attributed to xenoestrogens in things like plastic and drinking water. All you drinkers of bottled water don't think you're safe from exposure to these xenoestrogens either. While the chemical compounds may be different, we do know that there are some plastics and other chemicals that are found in water bottles that can contribute to the altering of hormone levels as well. In particular, studies have shown that the chemical compounds found in plastic water bottles can often leach into the water contained inside when those plastic bottles sit out in the sun or in heat for too long. The transmission of these harmful chemical compounds into the water would still be happening, of course, when the bottle is not exposed to heat, only at a slower rate. So, even if the water bottle isn't heated up, you're still arguably ingesting some of these harmful plastics and chemical compounds. Now, all of this stuff might seem quite scary, but I don't want you to swear off drinking water just yet. Indeed, despite the negative chemical impacts, from a general health perspective, it is much better for the human body to drink water, even if it is tap water, than it would be for you to subsist solely off of carbonated beverages or alcohol or any other artificial chemically enhanced drink that contains poisons for the body. However, the long-term impact of consuming the chemicals and hormones 
within publicly treated water and within plastic water bottles cannot be ignored. A few lucky people, like myself, find themselves living in areas where they can go and collect clean spring water for drinking. This naturally sourced water, of course, does not contain any of the harmful chemical or hormonal components found in tap water. And any concerns of bacterial infection stemming from this natural water can be waved away simply by boiling the water or running it through a charcoal filter. That being said, many of us unfortunately do not live in such an area where we can have access to clean, spring-fed water. If you find yourself in this situation, my friends, I would highly recommend that you look into a personal home water filtration system. A simple Brita filter alone is not going to cut it to remove all the chemical and hormonal components found in modern tap water. Sure, it might be a bit of an investment investing in this type of water filtration system, but I guarantee you it's going to have overall positive benefits on your health in the long run. On that note, we might as well discuss other things people drink in both the Americas and in Europe and all around the world for that matter, coffee is a particularly common drink. Um, you might have often heard people who say, oh, you know, I can't do anything in the morning without my cup of coffee. I mean, whether or not people recognize this by stating this or simply by living like this, you're essentially addicted to the caffeine in coffee. And that's quite understandable. Caffeine, maybe with the exception of sugar, is perhaps the most common addiction in the world. And while we don't like to think of it as an addiction because, you know, it's a common chemical substance that's in a lot of foods, it is nonetheless addictive. And if you really can't function in the morning without having a coffee, that's not something to take lightly. Now, I can completely understand why people drink coffee. I mean, it's been part of a European breakfast tradition for a long time. And caffeine does have its benefits. It is a very useful kick of energy. And I'm not advocating against drinking coffee. But if you drink coffee so much in that you rely upon it as your source of energy, that's quite clearly a problem. Now, if you want to get some caffeine, but you don't want to drink coffee, there's lots of other ways you can do that too. I actually don't drink coffee at all. I instead opt for tea. You know, that's probably <laughs> quite typical for the British colonial, but I digress. I like tea, and there's many great varieties of teas. You can go for simple black tea and drink it as the English would with... Um, milk and sugar. I actually use honey in my tea. It's a more natural source of sugar. You support the bees and it's good for your throat. There are also other teas that have caffeine in them that you don't need to add anything into. The oriental teas in particular are very good. My favorite Asian style tea is a green tea known as Longjing, which means dragon well. The tea leaves are sourced from one region of China in particular, and it's a very great kind of earthy green tea and it gives you a lot of energy in the morning, so if you're trying to wean off of coffee a little bit, I would definitely recommend picking up some Long Jing tea. I always use it when I'm getting up early in the morning for a long drive. It gives a bit more kick than regular black tea, so it's great. Now, this ultimately depends on where you live, but in most areas, there's often an herbal plant that will grow in the wild that can provide a sort of caffeine-like kick if you chew on it. Up here in the subarctic boreal forest, there's a plant that grows that's called bearberry. I believe the natives call it knickknick. And if you chew the leaves of this plant, it's supposed to give you a nice jolt of energy. Back when I was working as an archaeologist, I stumbled upon it a few times and chewed on the leaves. And I have to admit, it did uh, put a little bit of pep in my step, but nothing too crazy. Now... While we're talking about things that you consume for energy, we might as well bring up the topic of energy drinks. Now, I know a lot of the older audience probably doesn't drink energy drinks, but I can assure you they're very popular amongst the youth. And even in my generation, people would drink energy drinks pretty commonly. I have to admit, back in my university days, particularly when I was working on my master's dissertation, I would consume the odd energy drink every now and then to stay on top of my energy levels. But, good gods, I, I can't 
stress this enough. It's really not worth the health risk. Um, energy drinks have a huge burden on your organs, your heart and liver in particular. And over time, with frequent and repeated usage of these drinks, that burden on your organs gets more and more built up until the point where it can result in catastrophic organ failure. Now, don't get me wrong, I get it, you know. You've had a long day, and maybe you just want to drink a bang energy drink before you go to the gym. But if you're going to the gym in the first place, you should already recognize that the things you put into your body ultimately make up your body. So, you might want to rethink that energy drink before you go for your next PR. For those of you listening to this podcast right now, if you are constantly finding that you have low energy levels throughout the day, you should not be trying to medicate these low energy levels with caffeine, but should instead focus on making sure that you're getting enough sleep every day. There's always that old saying that you should get at least 8 hours of sleep every day and... For the most part, that reigns true. In fact, if you can afford to, you should get more than 8 hours of sleep. For everyone who lifts, you know that sleep is super critical for the repairing of the muscles that is required for you to get stronger after you hit the gym. Sleep is also an integral element of the body's natural process to produce testosterone. So maybe spending a long night out with the boys isn't the most masculine thing you can do, fellas. For spiritual reasons alone, you should desire to have a healthy sleeping schedule. From a variety of our ancestral sources of tradition, we know that the gods, our ancestors, and spirits attempt to communicate with us through our dreams. If you feel like you're not experiencing the divine in daily life, maybe you're just not dreaming enough. Food for thought. Anyway, we'll move on to the next topic. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast since its very beginning, you will know that I am a practicing worshipper of the ancient Indo-European gods, but I particularly feel a strong attraction to the god of the sun, Sol. Indeed, Sol attracts a lot of worshippers in these dark times. Recently, there has been some criticism over the growing solar movement. Indeed, The solar cult has seen a lot of growth in the past year. In these dark times, many have turned to soul's warmth and light for guidance. And indeed, a number of people have risen on social media platforms like Instagram, myself included, who advocate a return to the worship of the primordial sun. There exists an ignorant few who do not recognize the sun's true divinity, do not recognize his infinite radiance, and as a result, they lambast people who advocate the solar way. They view us as just jumping on a popular trend, that we are false pagans simply viewing the sun as a symbol of hope. Now, I don't really see what's wrong viewing the sun as a symbol of hope. Indeed, it is a symbol of hope in these dark times. After all, the sun is the greatest enemy that the enemies of our people fear. Those who criticize the quote-unquote solar movement fail to recognize that the sun is not merely an inspirational symbol. It's not worshipped for merely pseudo-intellectual theological reasons. The sun is worshipped and should be worshipped by all of mankind because It provides life on Earth with radiance and warmth. On a quite scientific level even, the sun allows life on Earth to exist. For humans, the sun radiates on us and warms our skin. It provides us with the vitamin D that we need to critically function. For people like me who live in the North and don't live near the equator, The sun is a constant friend in the summer, watching over you as you hike through the land. In the winter, it is a friend that has gone away, a friend that you deeply miss. Without the sun being there, life seems dark and grim, as it should be, for this is the nature of the winter season. When the sun returns inevitably in the spring, 
you greatly look forward to the return of the sun, for it is akin to the returning of a friend after a long journey. What more proof for the divine could you need? You can look up overhead, this great radiant orb shining down on all of mankind. If you look at it too long, you will be blinded, and is that in itself not the image of true divinity that is depicted to us in our ancestral sources? I can understand why a select few would want to rebel against a growing movement. Indeed, to some it seemed cool to resist trends, to seem in a hipster sort of sense against the common edge. But we have to face the facts here. The quote-unquote solar movement is growing, not simply because of the potential of the sun as a symbol. The solar movement's growth is not just a trend. It's reflective of humanity's return to the recognition and worship of one true God that exists among many others. A God that is ever-present and shines down on us, literally blessing us with warmth and radiance and health. If you want to rebel against this, if you want to think that the return to the worship of the sun is merely a trend, go ahead. I'll happily absorb as much sun as I can. You can continue to put other poisons into your body. Now, exposure to the sun provides mankind with much more than just vitamin D. Soul's radiance is the fundamental source of all energy on Earth, and the absorption of the sunlight by mankind's skin allows us to produce a variety of chemicals and other compounds that are essential to the functioning of our bodies. While we often like to think of our skin as a sort of protective shield that covers our body and our organs, it's more appropriate to recognize that the skin is an organ itself. The skin is a membrane that interacts with everything it touches and often absorbs things from the things we touch. Whether it be smoke, chemicals, water, the sun, or suntan lotion, everything that touches your skin is taken into the body. One important thing to recognize when it comes to sun exposure and absorbing sunlight with your skin is that the body's absorption of sunlight and the associated production of healthy vitamins and other natural chemicals occurs within the body locally. Simply put, this means that the vitamins produced by your body after absorbing sunlight will only be produced in the areas where they absorbed sunlight. So, if you absorbed sunlight on your face and on your neck, the vitamin D within your body will be produced locally in your face and your neck. We also know that vitamin D is crucial in the body's production of many reproductive hormones, including testosterone. This alone should explain to you the importance of genital sunning. By exposing the areas of your skin surface that cover your reproductive organs, you are allowing for the creation of local vitamin D and other helpful chemical compounds in the reproductive organs. So sunning your balls isn't just another quirky health trend blown up by the masses. It actually is an important element in contributing to the body's production of healthy hormone levels. There are a number of other spiritual benefits associated with sun absorption too, but that's a topic for another day. I've made the health benefits associated with the worship of soul quite evident by this point. But soul's infinite radiance contributes more to our health than just vitamin D. After all, sunlight is the basic source of energy in this universe. Soul's radiance is absorbed by plants, which produce glucose. The plants are then eaten by animals, and in turn, humans eat the plants and animals, therefore ingesting soul's divinity, and from this, we develop our life energies. That being said, when food is processed on an industrial scale, when additives and other chemicals are added to food, 
that food is further and further distance from soul's divinity. And as a result, it's quite clear that such foods and all of the chemical additives are not good for the healthy, proper functioning of the body. Now, I'm sure this is a lesson most of you have already learned, but just in case there's a few in the audience that are curious. As a general rule, it is best in life to not eat any processed foods or fast food if you can avoid it. Such foods are full of chemical and hormonal additives and ultimately do not contribute to the functioning of a healthy body. For optimal body health, you want to eat natural foods that are as far distanced from the food industry as possible. This way, you'll avoid eating any harmful chemical additives and will ultimately be adding better ingredients to your body's makeup. You can get this food locally sourced from a farmer's market, not from some faceless supermarket corporation. Rather, you'll get your food from people in your community, people with a face and a story. And at the end of the day, when you're eating that food, you'll know that somebody in your community's hard work went into its production. It shouldn't come to surprise then that these more natural and locally sourced foods ultimately taste better than any of the processed junk you can get in a store. And they make you feel better too. Yeah, that's one of the best perks of me currently living in the area where I am. Northeast British Columbia is in the heart of ranching territory. Every weekend I can go to my local farmer's market and talk with ranchers. I can get great prices on phenomenal quality beef. And I can even learn the story of the animal that I'm eating. And I feel like that makes it so much more special. It makes me appreciate the food more. Because when I go home at night and I start to cook that steak, I know that I'm not just eating another slab of protein found on some plastic board in a supermarket. No, I know that I'm eating what used to be a living animal, a beautiful, majestic creature living under the stretch of Dios's sky. An animal that lived a happy life, eating grass in a pasture, until its life was brought to an abrupt but appropriate conclusion. Is this not what the animal deserves? Surely the cow is a divine animal and should be treated as such. This is more than just an issue of animal welfare. I mean, the meat from the locally sourced cow will taste better. The animal wasn't raised in suffering on some factory farm and slaughtered abruptly. The animal lived a good, fulfilling life. I would imagine that the suffering of the animal is absorbed into the meat. Maybe then, if you were eating such meat, that suffering is transferred into you. No studies can prove this, but studies don't prove a lot these days. <laughs> While we're on the topic of farmers markets, I thought I'd bring up a very interesting point that I don't hear a lot of people talking about. But it's that not all farmers markets are created equal. Now you've known for the past year or so I've been living in a very rural area. And this is an area with lots of farmers of many sorts, so I can go to a farmers market that's hosted and staffed by real farmers and I can get farm fresh beef and other meats, farm fresh eggs and farm fresh produce. When I was still living in southern Ontario, the most urbanite area of Canada, I would go to farmers markets and there would be a good amount of actual farmers who were there selling their own produce, but for some reason there was a lot of people who owned booths and they simply just resold produce that they bought from the farmers. And to an extent, they were almost trying to seem like they were the farmers themselves. Though obviously this wasn't the case. As you can imagine, most of these resale vendors, of course, were not of Canadian stock. I mean, it's quite amazing to think, you know, farmers markets are kind of a popular thing these days. But just imagine how many farmers markets there is throughout North America and perhaps other parts of the world where the supposedly farm fresh produce and meats and other such goods you're getting are not actually produced by the person selling you the, the goods. Like, 
might as well go to a supermarket at that point. <laughs> and it just becomes a more expensive supermarket. Once again, folks, another reason why you should move out of urban settings and into rural environments. Now, another great perk of going to your local farmer's market and making connections with these local food producers is that it allows you to find a source for some food items that are not too common to find elsewhere. For example, in Canada, raw milk is technically illegal to sell at a commercial level, but if you go to a farmer's market and you have the right connections, you will undoubtedly be able to find a source of raw milk, which has a number of nutritional advantages to regular pasteurized milk. If you're more interested on the topic of raw milk, there's many other videos and podcasts that discuss it, and I have a pretty informative post about it on my Instagram, so definitely check that out. Now, of course, the best option of all is for you yourself to secure the sources of food that you and your family are consuming. Now, there are a number of ways to do this. For simple things like produce and certain meats, you can get by using homesteading, permaculture, as well as animal husbandry. I personally know a lot of people that raise chickens for eggs and lots of people who also grow crops like potatoes in their garden. Yeah, unfortunately up here in the north we have shorter growing seasons, so there's certain things you can't grow, but you can get by growing the necessities. Myself and many others in the north are also big hunters, and often hunting forms a major part of the meat we consume. Yeah, it's funny that there's so many delusional kind of vegan types who talk about the negative environmental footprint of eating meat, but, you know, putting aside that most of this is propaganda to begin with, as a hunter, the meat you're getting is already being produced by the land in a natural ecosystem. You're really not having any quote-unquote carbon footprint at all by eating hunted meats. Of course, game isn't for everybody. Certain animals have pretty strong tastes, but I think it's an acquired taste. I think you can get used to it if you eat enough game in time. I am a big advocate for eating like our ancestors. Simply put, if the main components of your diet resemble the main components of the diet of our ancestors, you will not only be physically healthier, but spiritually healthier. By consuming the same types of food that they do, and by gaining these foods the same ways they gained it, and it's quite obvious that they didn't go to a supermarket, then your soul will be nourished in such a way so as to allow better experiences of the divine nature of our universe. Of course, it goes without saying that these natural, high-quality ingredients are much more appropriate ritual sacrifice offerings for the gods as well. Yes, technically you could offer any milk to the gods, but offering raw milk to the gods is much more appropriate. After all, raw milk is richer, has more nutrition, and more resembles the milk offered to the gods by our ancestors. So, of course, the gods would be more receptive to hearing the requests of one who offers such a rare treat these days. Another important element of dietary health that's often ignored is oils. Now, don't let the old Cold War dietary propaganda fool you. Fats and oils are healthy in the sense that they are an important element needed by our body to function. Now, the important lesson to take here is that not all fats and oils are created equal. In fact, some of them were quite literally created in agricultural laboratories to allow for cheaper means of sustaining humans. This is canola oil, but most other seed oils are not healthy for human consumption either, despite the fact that common dietary scientists will make no mention of seed oils. Again, as a rule of thumb, it's good to follow by this principle that the healthiest diet for your body will resemble a diet eaten by your ancestors. Our ancestors, as steppe pastoralists, 
would of course have a lot of fat in their diet, but most of it wasn't plant-based. These fats would come from the meat they consume, as well as milk, butter, and other dairy products. So if you're going to be cooking with some sort of fat or oil, it's best to use butter or perhaps ghee, which is an Indian liquidy form of butter. I would definitely recommend it if you've never tried it. If you want to save some money, but you still don't want to eat seed oils, which are horrible for you, then the best option you have is to consume olive oil, as it really doesn't have the same negative health effects as other oils. The problem with olive oil is that export standards differ greatly by country, and often, if you're exporting olive oil, it doesn't really need to be that pure. While it's not always stated on the bottle, sometimes you can get quote-unquote olive oil that's in reality 40% olive oil and 60% some other type of seed oil or vegetable oil. But I would definitely recommend that if you need to use a vegetable oil or seed oil of some sort, that you use olive oil, which much more closely resembles natural fats from animals than it does seed oils on a chemical level. All right, we've discussed water, caffeine, sunlight, food. These are the topics I wanted to cover in this episode, and we're getting close to that one hour mark, so I think it's about time that I wrap up the episode. I'll just give you a quick glimpse into what I've been up to recently. I'm still working diligently away on the spiritual guidebook that many of you requested. This is taking a lot of time away from other projects, but I can guarantee you I'm still going to be working as hard as I can to bring you guys as much quality Indo-European spiritual content as I can. Up here in Hyperborea, the days are getting shorter and shorter, and I can tell that winter is on its way. In fact, It'll be here very soon. This is always a hard time for me, because, you know, I am primarily a worshipper of soul. And so, when you see soul for so few hours a day, on some days, not even at all, it's very spiritually draining. But, thankfully, during these times, us dwellers in the north can look to the moon for light and guidance. There seems to be a common misconception among people in the solar worship community, that the moon itself is a sort of antithesis to the sun. But the reality couldn't be any farther from the truth. The moon is always paired with the sun in mythology, and for a good reason. On dark nights, the moon reflects soul's light and divinity, and the moon is the only companion to the hunter trying to put food on his table throughout the winter. I'm planning to go on a few hunts soon, so I'll let you know how those go. That's going to be all for this podcast. My name is Rex, and I am proud that I could have served as your momentary escape from the soul-crushing insanity of the Kali Yuga. If you enjoyed today's podcast and enjoy listening to other episodes of the Son of the North podcast, I would ask that you consider supporting me on Patreon or supporting me via a crypto donation at the links available in the bio. Your financial support will allow me to continue spreading the good word of our ancestral traditions and deities. Furthermore, patronage is not without its perks, as you will gain early access to episode and access to exclusive episodes of the Sun of the North podcast that often cover topics that cannot be touched upon on YouTube or Spotify or other platforms. That's going to be all for this week's episode, but I'll see you all next time. May the gods bless you and your loved ones in the weeks to come.